you know, it has to be cast iron, whatever you're doing. They traditionally would do it in the big cauldrons, um, but Dutch ovens work just as well. You have to have two that are the exact same size so that the mouths of them line up perfectly. That's very important because if you do this wrong, this whole thing can explode and kill you. Um, so it's important to be careful and to do it right. And so what I'll do is I'll take one of these, I'll rip off this handle, I'll rip off this lid, and it's best if you can find like old rusty ones or cheap ones because you're never gonna want to cook in these again after you do this with it. Um, so you kind of have two dedicated Dutch ovens for it. And then the bones that you want to use Really what is producing the bone sauce is the bone marrow. So you can use smoked bones, you can use unsmoked bones, you can use rotten bones, you can use fresh bones, but you don't want to use bones that have already been used for stock because they're not going to have any of the marrow left in them. Um, chicken bones, you can throw them in there, but again, they're not producing a lot of marrow. So beef, deer, pig, those are the kinds of bones that I've found to work best for this. And so you take the one Dutch oven, you fill it up all the way with bones. Sometimes, depending on what we're working with, I'll even break them apart to fit more in there and get more marrow. Because basically, the more marrow you have packed into that top Dutch oven, the more sauce you're going to get as a result out of this. Uh, and so you take that one that's full of bones, you put a screen over it. I usually use lath because that works up really well. You could use a thick hardware cloth some metal screen that's not going to break down under heat and so you wrap that all around and then put the one dutch oven into the other and then what you do is you dig a hole so here's grade in this drawing you dig a hole down and you flip this whole contraption upside down oh sorry one thing that you need to do first too is sprinkle just a little bit of water i mean just like from a bottle that's it into the bottom one and so then you flip the bones onto the bottom one. So now you've got one Dutch oven in the ground, a little bit of water, and then the other Dutch oven faced into it with the bones all packed in, the hardware cloth in between. Now what you do is you pack this whole joint really well with clay. Because here's where this thing can get dangerous. Basically, if there's any little gap in here and an ember gets in here, boom, you're having a bad time. Um, so you pack all of that really well with clay, and then you bury that whole seal so that you're, you're redundant, basically. You've got the earth covering from any embers getting in here, and you've got the clay covering from any embers getting in here. Then what you do is you build a fire around this thing to get it going. I usually just use basically one. So what you're going to have sticking up is like that. And I use one rung of logs, split logs around it. Um, and then I get all of the energy from that fire. So I'll put the coals on top of the oven. I basically work that one fire till all of the heat's out of it. Um, maybe about four to six hours of burn time. It's easy to burn it, and it's also easy to not cook it enough. So you gotta kind of find that line. You should end up with bones that are charred, but sauce that is not black, but kind of dark yellowish um, and what, what what did you say that you said bones that would be charred or what? yep the bones that are left as a result up here should be black and charred but usually when I do it just right it's like all of these are charred and then there's a just a handful that aren't charred in the bottom of this whole thing and so you want them to just be charred basically if all of them are are just charred that's perfect um, and so then what you want to do is you want to let this whole contraption just sit sit tidy cool leave it for the rest of the day before you open it up because uh, again you're dealing with fats that are in a fairly explosive stage because they're hot and in an oxygen free environment um, and compressed basically question um, how big of a fire are you build around it and how long would just, I mean, like a pot like this, I would use, you know, maybe like six or eight split logs and just that. And so you're having a total fire with coals and everything of like four to six hours. Um, and these are rough guidelines. Really, you've got to do it and see 
how charred the bones are and how much sauce you got out of it and what the color of the sauce is. And it still works when it's burned, it just doesn't work as well. And if you didn't cook it long enough, you're just not gonna really have any sauce in the bottom of it. Um, so you gotta kind of figure out how big of a fire you need for your specific pots that you're using and the amount of bones that you're using and things like that. But that's kind of the <coughs> general guidelines. And so then what you're left with is this soupy, nasty smelling concoction down in the bottom. Um, and it should be solid at room temperature because it is an animal fat. And you know, for a lot of people, they think it smells like an old nasty barbecue grill. Um, when I use a lot of this, I'm dry heaving and like almost throwing up. So I think it's one of those things where, you know, just taking a whiff of it, it's like, oh, that's not bad, but work with it for a day, get it on your hands and it's there for a week and you don't wanna ever smell it again. Um, and so what I end up doing is I pour this all off into mason jars and some people will cut this with an oil that's soluble at room temperature to make it easier to apply. I prefer not to, I prefer to just, I take an old coffee pot, heat up some water in it, stick the mason jar in that, and I use that heat to basically liquefy all of the animal fats in the bone sauce. And then what you do, and this is probably the most important part of this, you're not painting this all over the tree. That's gonna kill the tree, for sure. Um, all you're doing is you're giving it a Jackson Pollock flick, basically. So I take my paintbrush, dip it in there, flick on the tree, that's it, that's done. That tree's done for the next couple of months. Uh, Zepp says you apply it once and it lasts until the tree's big enough that you don't have to worry about the browsing on it anymore. I like to apply it every spring and fall because this is cheap and easy to make. That's like, why not? Um, and I've had really good success basically because spring and fall are the times when deer browse is the worst. Fall going into winter, and then spring before all the greenery is out. In the middle of summer, they have some more stuff to choose from, so the pressure is not as strong. Um, and it keeps in a mason jar indefinitely, as far as I'm concerned. If it rots and gets nasty, that's kind of the point of it. Um, so I'm not too worried about that. And I think that, is there any? Can you put it on any of the plants? What about the plants? That I wouldn't want to eat this. Okay, I, <laughs> I definitely <laughs> wouldn't. Put <laughs> it around it and kind of keep the deer out of that. Yeah, I think you probably could. And what I've found is I've, uh, I mean, the deer are in the greater <coughs> garden every day. And they don't touch a single tree or bush that I've applied this to, but they will eat all the turnips, radishes, all the vegetables that I don't apply this to. So I'm not exactly clear if it has to be on the plant or just close to it. Um, certainly something to try, but yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't eat anything that has had this on it. Because really what you're doing is you're putting this on the trunk or on the branches of the tree and you're applying it before or after it's had its fruit and blossoms. Um, so, yeah. Does this help at all with uh, antler rubbing? No. Nope. We did, <laughs> the one tree we did lose was two antler rubbing. Um, so no, it doesn't, unfortunately. How much area roughly would a, a pot? I pot made, my pots are a little <laughs> bit bigger than this, maybe like this. And I made one batch last spring. I probably applied it to 500 trees. I got two quarts out of that one batch. I have one full quart left and one quarter quart. I probably gave away half a quart and used a quarter quart. On uh, 500 trees? On 500 trees. And does so it, it goes far. Okay. And does it have to be cast iron? Yes. It has to be cast iron. I just, yes. I would be worried about it blowing up otherwise. Oh, if you use any other kind of pot. Yeah, you you might be able to, but just, I w would say only use cast iron because that's the only thing I know that's safe. When you pack, oh, sorry. Good. When you pack the bones in, so you're saying just go ahead and pack the bones in a pot and then put a hard wire cloth over it mm -hmm. and then and then just flip it. Yep, okay. Yep, and sometimes, depending on what you're working with, I mean, if you have a lot of bones, I'll break them up with a mini sledge mm -hmm. and just pack them in there tight. And then with that hardware cloth, I wrap it around the edges, like the lid of the, uh, 
I'll wrap it around all of this so that it really stays on there when I go to flip this over into the other pot. And the bones, do you, do you want most of the meat off or does it matter? Um, the meat's not really getting you anything. It's okay if there's some meat on it. It's not like it's not going to work. Um, but, you know, I mean, I've used stuff with a little bit of meat on it. Yeah, that's fine. But the marrow is what you're really after. So once you cook for four to six hours and you put it in the mason jar, you need to wait a certain amount of time. I, don't, I might have missed that. Uh, no, nope. it's ready to go. It's ready to go. You could apply it right out of this culture, basically. Uh, yeah. So um, you mentioned you could use old bones or new bones. It doesn't matter so much. Uh, you just have to have the marrow. So there's certain maybe certain parts of the animal, certain bones that don't have as much marrow, maybe or. What would yeah, oh yeah. I mean, like these bones are all great. All the big bones are really great, and you can see. I like mean, a if skull. You can, if you can stick yeah, your finger so in the marrow, yeah, a skull is not going to have much, and I don't think cool. you want to use the brain. Um, but you can, you if you can see and touch and smell the marrow, those are good bones to use. You think applying that to fence posts? would keep a, a deer from wanting to cross the fence? Potentially. Um, potentially. I don't think that's that's probably not the best use for it, but it may work. Because, I mean, I've noticed it's been spread all around this garden. They still come into the garden. Okay. Definitely, they just don't touch the trees that I've applied it to. Got it. Okay. So, maybe. Try it and find out. And let me know. <laughs> so around the fence up here, the fence around the garden behind the house. Uh huh. That would possibly be a good barrier. It'd be a good experiment to do. Yeah, definitely, definitely. That fence is already kind of deer resistant. Yeah. You have to jump pretty and high. Does it matter what kind of critter the bones come from? Um, no. Just that it has a lot of marrow. Uh, I think if you want to make the most effective bone sauce, if it's for deer, deer bones are probably the best. Um, but, you know, it, it's all going to work. Golly. <laughs> <laughs> but after it ran into the chipper, the author. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Paul's description of it is that when the deer taste the bone sauce on the tree, then they, That's like, the wish that they didn't have a tongue in their mouth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, definitely. And most of the time, what I've found is they just don't even... So you're kind of building the fire on top of the pot and, yes. and packing logs all around it and just getting that heat centered onto the top of the pot? Yep, and it's, yeah, so all of this is buried in the ground and all your fire is up here. And the same way you kind of cook with a Dutch oven normally, you know, where you're putting the coals on top of the oven mm -hmm. and, and heating up the cast iron and getting the heat transfer that way. Okay, and how much water did you say to put in the bottom? Uh, just a splash. Okay. You know, not even like a tablespoon or two. Yeah. Have you tried the crushing the bones and just taking the marrow out and then cooking that without going through the process? Is there something in the process? That uh, well, there's a lot in the heat process, but do you mean as far as if you were to just put marrow in the pot instead of the bones? That would probably work. I think the difficulty would be in just keeping it up there, which I guess maybe you don't even need to do. I don't know. I, I'm not experienced enough with it to say, and I've just kind of followed the recipe that I've gotten as, as closely as I can. Uh, and I will say, I've made this three times now. The first two times we burned it, and the third time we actually did it well, and I had a chef helping me, so I think that. <laughs> <laughs> Is that wood or charcoal? Wood, yeah, wood. And then just using the coals from that, putting those on the fire, or on the, on the top of the cast iron. You probably could use charcoal too. Um, I just don't know how the temperature would play out. You'd have to, I, I'm sure it would work. You'd just have to figure out how many coals you actually need to get everything to the right temperature. Uh, that I don't know. Yeah. I, I just know the end result is that all of the bones <laughs> are just <laughs> charred. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know what the right temperature or even really the duration is. I just know that when we cooked it and all these bones were charred thoroughly and we ended up with brown sauce, black sauce, 
Depp said that was burned. Still works, but it 